it's my pleasure. <laughs> it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Christoph. He'll be, he's visiting us uh, for three months uh, as a visiting researcher. Uh, I'll let him tell his affiliation, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, this, which will be recorded much remotely, will be a chance for him to actually meet some of the other people uh, throughout research and in the company that are working on visualization, pixel-based techniques, and HoloLens. So, without further ado. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. So, um, so it's really my pleasure here today to, to, to present my, my, my work. So it's a compilation of the thing that I've been doing since 2009 uh, in my university, which is, uh, which is called uh, ENAC, French Civil Aviation University. And uh, this, uh, so I'm, I'm working in Toulouse, south of France, right here. And uh, here are some fancy pictures of uh, the, the, the campus. And uh, here at, uh, at ENAC, we, we train uh, engineers, air traffic controllers, pilots, and uh, a lot of people, uh, practitioners, that will be close to the aeronautical, aeronautical um, uh, uh, field. And uh, so uh, I give you some bunch of uh, pictures there where you can see uh, some simulators, like uh, flight simulators, air traffic controllers simulators, like in a, in a tower or in a control center, and supervision, where you have a lot of engineers that are working to make all of this system work. We also do have a lot of uh, PhD students, and uh, this is a, a very quick uh, video that shows you how you get from the flight to the air traffic control and air traffic management. And uh, air traffic controllers are doing their job with thanks to radar screen, and uh, we try here to do the kind of link between the flight and its information and how it's displayed on a radar screen, thanks, thanks to something that we call the, the comet. So, and uh, this is uh, the kind of the uh, kind of view that the air traffic controllers are using, and it's a uh, highly collaborative work, and uh, with a lot of uh, communication and human computer interaction uh, issues and problems that have to be to be solved at uh, at some point. Okay, and uh, this is another video where you 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 see actual air traffic controllers doing their their, their job with uh, thanks to this radar screen, and they also use this paper strip. So maybe you already heard about that, but it's a piece of paper where, uh, where you have all the information of a given aircraft. And you can see how this object is very important in their, their, day, uh, their day work. It's a, it's a tangible object. They can share it. They annotate it. They move it. They strange their structure, their layout. And thanks to that, it's a way to, to somehow externalize the information they had in mind to not only to avoid a uh, crash between aircraft, it's not that. It's more like how to optimize the traffic. So in terms of uh, fuel consumption, time reduction, and uh, all of this optimization is, is a very, very complex work. And the air traffic controllers are really good to do that, thanks to this uh, tangible object. But uh, nowadays, uh, this piece of paper is uh, about to disappear. And before it disappeared, uh, we wanted to investigate what uh, its asset could be. So we built this system, which is called Striptic, where we, we took advantage of the, this paper, and we also wanted to take advantage of uh, IT systems. At search, on the paper, there is no way to update information because information on the paper is there forever, right? But we used uh, top, bottom projection, all of these anotopen devices to update this information, thanks to tracking system or, or, or that thing. So uh, I think I have a couple of uh, demos, videos here that shows you how it's working. So like the user is pointing on the paper or on the screen, thanks to a pen. But this is a standard pen, except that there is a camera. You know, this is the Anoto technology. And the user can write with the electronic ink, if he will, or with the standard ink. You have also this kind of interaction, which is really interesting. interesting. It's, a, it's a tangible computing. You move the paper strip, and the system computes a new landing sequence, for instance, or do other kind of compu compu computation to avoid uh, complex crossing, all that stuff. So when, when the aircraft controllers are told that the paper strips are going away, what, what is their reaction? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really long discussion. But, uh, in fact, they, uh, it's a long process. So they know that it will happen no matter what. So because the industry just provides new system without the paper. And, uh, and there are some uh, countries where they have been working without the paper for a long time. And uh, it's like a common fate. They know that's going to disappear. But uh, when you talk to them and they say that we are really good with the paper and we want to keep the paper as well. Okay? But uh, they, they, they couldn't fight, uh, fight against that. So they know that that's the fate. And uh, well, so 
Right now in France, we still have the paper, and we'll, it will go on maybe for five to ten more years. We'll, we'll see. What's the argument for getting rid of the paper? I mean, I, I can guess what they are, but... The recommendation, you mean? Oh, yeah, why are they getting rid of it? Uh, why? It's just uh, an issue regarding how information are not updated. So I can just give you a very simple uh, example. You tell an aircraft to turn left, right? So you write it down on the paper. But the system is not aware that this aircraft is going to turn, you see? And then, in terms of forecasting what will happen, the system is just stuck until he sees that the aircraft is turning, and then it can be updated. And that's one of the major issues in terms of optimization. Since you don't know what the air traffic controllers gave order to the aircraft, you somehow injure the system. And that's why they really want to get rid of the paper. But we know that there's other options, like voice recognition, all that stuff, but it's not yet as, uh, as efficient as uh, entering information in the, in the system. But it's a very interesting question, and I can give you some more thought about that. Uh, after the presentation. So in terms of evolution, uh, there is a new, um, new features that are coming, which, which are called the remote tower. So the remote tower is, is a concept that is already operational in the north uh, countries in, in, in Europe, where air traffic controls are not anymore in a control tower. They are remote. Why do we do that? It's a, it's a way to optimize uh, costs and also maybe to optimize efficiency. So I won't go into why you, you, we, we really want to do some augmented tower, but at ENAC, we really wanted to investigate these new uh, features thanks to the technology. So we, we started to build uh, new systems with uh, cameras on the airfield, uh, with immersive environment, with eye tracking system. And because ENAC, we have our, um, our own airfield, a small one, but still we can run experimentation on that. We did some, um, a uh, new design with uh, eye gaze zoom center techniques. So it's pretty obvious. You look at a given aircraft and you ask to zoom, and this given aircraft remains at the same location on the screen. And it's uh, done with an eye tracking system. This one is, uh, is somehow very interesting in terms of uh, usages. So <clears throat> an air traffic controller is facing his uh, radar screen, and uh, an aircraft is calling, like, OK, I will enter your area but this aircraft is not visible yet on the radar screen. So the system displays an arrow here. And usually, the air traffic controller has to use uh, his or a mouse to click on the arrow or to pan and zoom, okay, which is very painful, right? Especially because they have big screens and it's really hard to find the mouse cursor. So here, it's a very simple technique where you have the arrow. As long as you look at the arrow, the system do the pan and zoom. So if you look at the given aircraft, you still have a stationary visualization. When you're done with that, you look anywhere else, and then you get back on your original configuration. So I think it's something very, very efficient. It's not yet operational, for sure, but it's a kind of investigation that we are uh, doing at ENAC regarding the remote tower process. OK, this is uh, another video of our ongoing work uh, where we use uh, so that uh, uh, Oculus Rift, uh, so we put some cameras on the airfield, we build a 360 degrees views, and you have the operator that is able to look wherever he wants or she wants. And uh, maybe I will go back on the beginning of the video. So it's, it's very straightforward. When the user looks at a given aircraft, all the information regarding this aircraft is displayed like this. So it's a gaze-based. Uh, interaction and the user can change point of view and can turn the visualization to night vision and uh, so so now our goal is to investigate all of these features to build scenarios and try to assess how this new environment will uh, improve or make uh, make air traffic controllers more efficient okay so it was uh, a quick uh, overview of projects uh, that are directly connected to air traffic control. But my talk today will not be uh, on this kind of uh, system and interaction system. I will more uh, be focused on data visualization and in big data, interactive big data visualization. So uh, here are the different sections that are, uh, in terms of research, what are available at ENAC. We have the optimization, uh, uh, um, interactive informatics, telecommunication, and DEVI the one that belongs to, which is uh, data economy visualization. So 
optimization more or less deals with um, uh, mathematical computations. Uh, informatic interactive deals with human computer inter uh, interaction, tele telecommunication with, uh, well, so with uh, antennas, networks, and DEVI is a brand new um, lab which uh, deals with data, economy, and visualization. That's the one that belongs to. Here are the, um, the fields that we are going to investigate uh, in this uh, new lab. So you can have a look, but basically, uh, we are strongly linked to air traffic, control, uh, air traffic air transportation system. We are going to investigate how to collect a big data set, to clean them, to make them available to everyone, to try to make some strong tight uh, with uh, practitioners and academics. And, uh, and the thing I will be in charge of is this uh, last part, which is uh, interactive visualization of large data sets. And uh, this is what I'm going to, 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 to focus my talk uh, today. So uh, usually I start with this picture when I say that um, the way to collect data is not anymore really an issue today. It's still a bit of an issue, but we are now surrounded by this data. And the question is more like, uh, what can I do with all of this data? At some points, all of this data just hinders that, that, uh, the, the, this data extraction process. So for me, I try to, to find a, not a new way, but something a bit different. Like we can use machine learning or automatic data extraction to get insight or get information from this data set, or we can just think something very straightforward. Like what if the user could be the one to extract the data? And the machine is it's just a simple machine. It's able to do, it is able to do really simple computation. But what I want is that I will be able to understand what the machine is doing. And when I receive a, a, a result, no matter what, I can understand everything, like all the, the pipeline process. So to do that, um, we investigated a mix with visualization and interaction. And uh, also focused on something that uh, we call pixel-based algorithm, which means that all the computations will be done with the computer, but we, uh, in the graphic card. And the graphic card is using pixels, so that's why I call that pixel-based uh, algorithm. So, uh, my talk will be divided in uh, three parts. One will be on the, um, my initial work that I did during my PhD with brushing and linking techniques. So some of, uh, some, uh, some of you already know this from Daddy software. And then I will talk about uh, how we can simplify view, the view with uh, view aggregation and with uh, this uh, edge bundling technique. And uh, the last part will be devoted to uh, animations and how we can distort the view and thanks to animation we can help the user to extract from some information from a big data set. So, so the first thing will be from Daddy and now we'll jump into demos. Uh, so let's go there and let's start from Daddy it's here. So from Daddy uh, stands uh, for from data to visualization and uh, the basic idea there was just to display one day of recorded aircraft trajectories and try to see if um, we can give some interactions technique to the user so that it will be able to really dig into the data set and try to um, explore it in a smooth way. So here is a data set. Okay, I will just change a little bit the color like this. Okay. So sorry for the one who already knows uh, this, uh, this software, but here you have all the fields of your data set, which are the aircraft identifier, the, the, an ID, uh, the timestamp of the recording, the latitude, the longitude, the altitude, and some other uh, information. And on the right, okay, it's a bit uh, complex visualization, but uh, I use uh, the visual variables that have been introduced by, by Jacques Bertin, which are the X, Y, Z, of the screen, you know, it's not really the depth, it's something else. And uh, we have the colors, and then you can do some uh, connections between this data set and your view. So here, right now, the X is connected to the X of the screen, so longitude to latitude and so on. And then you can uh, connect the altitude like this to a color gradient, which means that low altitude aircraft will be displayed in green, high altitude aircraft will be displayed in blue. And you can dynamically just adjust the color. So it's not that fancy, but uh, when I first showed this system to air traffic control practi practitioners, 
they were pretty amazed because it's really fast. I mean, it's really standard, it's pan and zoom, right? But uh, at that time, it, uh, they, they didn't have su such system. And then the first thing that you do when you do some data exploration, you just want to get what you already know, right? So as an air traffic controller, what do you know from the aircraft trajectories? You know that you have these airlines, and you can see them here, right? With these blue lines, high altitude, pretty easy. You can see these streams. You also, you also know this airport. That's Roissy, Charles de Gaulle. And that's Toulouse, right here. Lyon, Geneva, which is good. You can also see some waiting loops right here, which is nice. And the thing that you may not expect is this. If I reduce, whoops, or if I filter low altitude, okay. You can see the outline of France right now, right, now, right here, right? And then you can just wondering, why can I see the outline of France? Because this is just pure aircraft trajectories. So, and it's green, so which means that you have a lot of aircraft flying low altitude around the coastline. So the question is why? It's pretty obvious, it's just for sightseeing. So it's a, it, it, I know it's something a bit strange, but that's something that air traffic controllers know. So the private pilots are used to fly it around the coastline just because it's nice, right? So that's perfect. But, so if you know France, you also know that, oops, here on the north part, you have coastline. But look, no aircraft, nobody. So why? Because it's ugly. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> it's a really nice coastline. So usually when I say that, yeah, there is all of these French people coming from the north that shouting at me like, ah! Okay, so, no, no, no. So there is another reason. So do you know why? It's not forbidden. No, you can do that. You can, it's possible. Yeah, it's also, yes, linked to meteorological conditions. So. To fly it with as a private pilot, you, you, you have to be able to see at a far distance. Visual yeah, visual flight, distance. And then at that time, it wasn't possible. And this is the kind of thing that we love to do when we do some data exploration. We want to find insight and something that we are not expected. So from this visualization, I can tell you that at that time, it wasn't, the weather conditions were not that good on the north of France. So, which is cool. You have the same issue right here, but it's also the Alps. So quite high mountains, so it's really hard to, to get there with the private pilots. Okay, so this is good. Oh, we can also uh, extract some information like this. You have these pilots that went around these sectors. It's normal. This time it was really forbidden at a, at a specific time. Okay, so we have this visualization. We can also do some um, configuration change like this. So the one who are from the InfoViz community knows this kind of animation. It's called, it's called scatter dice. So it's where you go from one type of visualization to another one in a smooth way. So it's a, it's a very convenient technique to help the user not to be disrupted during uh, his or her exploration. So for instance, if I want to know where the aircraft uh, from Paris are right here, so they are here, where do they end up here? It's quite hard to see, right? But if we do the animation, I have to play with the pan and zoom. Okay, you can follow them, right? It's right here, you can follow them, and then it's easy to understand. So it's a way to link visualization thanks to animation. And this uh, visualization is the altitude visualization here, and you can see that most of the aircraft have horizontal line. They are uh, somehow shrinked at the bottom and more sparse on the top, right? So now let's jump to something more interactive because Right now, it was just pure uh, visual configuration that changed over time. So this system allows brushing techniques, like that one. So if I want to extract aircraft that are uh, coming from the Atlantic Ocean and that landed at Roissy Charles de Gaulle, so um, with the raw data, it's not really that easy to do because it's somehow a, a fuzzy question, like aircraft coming from the Atlantic Ocean, right? I do not have this field in my data set, but visually, visually, it's here, right? So that's what I did. I brushed this, right? I brushed and I extracted this subset of the data. So I think that's, that's in terms of interaction, something very interesting. At some point here, I somehow cleared a little bit the view. So I just moved my data. So now. You selected and then you dragged it over so that you have the. Exactly. The yes. We call that brushing and spreading. So I now have my subset of my data right here. I can 
it can be useful to display the map again uh, to see where my airport is. That's here. But I just want these aircraft, right? So I can go on like this, and I brush. But you can see directly the result of my brush. It's not correct, because I also selected those aircraft. And if I have a closer look, those aircraft are blue, which means high altitude. See? So I just want the one that gets down. So I can use this uh, rotation animation, like this. In this case, you can see how it's helpful it is. Because the aircraft that I want are that one, you see? Without the animation, wow, you can make it, right? But it's, a, it's more complex, right? So right now, I can follow this, that the one I want, I can brush them, and it's done. Or there is another way to do it, it's here, is to say, OK, I don't want these aircraft. I remove them here, and I want that one. You see? And here, now it's done. And I can extract my data set. It will be displayed here, 65 aircraft, and I can go on. So why is it interesting to do that? It's the way that little by little, you refine your query. And you also can see why you're doing something right or wrong. So it's an iterative process that, at some point, have been very, very successful with air traffic controllers. Because uh, they wanted to extract from these data sets specific aircraft, flying aircraft, not, uh, not, not computed aircraft. Why? Because they wanted to be trained in specific con uh, situation. And that part, they need the actual aircraft. What, no matter what you do, even if you have very nice aircraft model, they figure out that this is not a, a, a standard aircraft. So because they have very complex behaviors. So, they wanted to, uh, to uh, extract, uh, it was 10 types of flights. And it took them three months to do that. And they used FormDaddy in one day, they, do, they did it. Just because they downloaded all the data, and just by picking, brushing, spreading, little by little, they refined and managed to extract what they really wanted to. Let's see. So I will show you uh, another demo of this. Because right now, we did. Um, a geographical exploration of this data set, I will jump into information visualization. Because in this data set, you saw that there are many fields right here. And there is one uh, combination of fields that was to be displayed, which is that one. It's a visualization of aircraft identifier and time. Time is on the x-axis, and on the y, you have the aircraft identifier. And this identifier is given incrementally over time. So the first one of the day has the number one, and so on, two, and, and then the slope of this curve tells you the traffic density. Because when you have a lot of aircraft coming at the same time, they get piled up, right? And then you have this uh, strong increase of the uh, curvature of this shape. And each aircraft here is displayed by an horizontal line. So you have many information, like the uh, average uh, time flight over France, which is the width of this shape two hours. And you have also this. You have some outliers. So maybe I can remove that. You have some outliers uh, with very long duration flight. So you can use, again, this brushing technique. Brush them. You spread them here. You go on like this. And then you get back to the XY visualization. And then you extract this strange aircraft. I can show you the map. So he went over the Atlantic Ocean, did some egg shape. So, well, and I can go on like this. And then I have this aircraft, that, which is a, OK, I can check how uh, its altitude is quite high. It's uh, almost 10 kilometers high. And you can go on like this. So for sure, it's pretty easy, right? I just extracted aircraft with a long duration flight. But I managed to do that thanks to random visualization, because first, I didn't know that such aircraft was, uh, was in this data set. So since I'm able to just change the view, brush, and go on like this, I say, OK, this is something interesting that was to be investigated. And uh, this software has been many, many times used just to define the kind of query we can do. So, and then, once the query has been done, uh, we can use other system to make it automatic, you see? So what I think what is interesting is the way that the user can easily interact with this kind of data set, not only this kind of data set, but any kind of data set, and uh, try to uh, understand what kind of information he or she can extract from it. Um, 
let's go back to the presentation. I will show uh, an extension of, of this uh, with the work that we did with uh, Roland Shippens. And uh, it was presented last year at InfoViz. And the, 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 the idea was to extend from Daddy in a sense that we wanted to show the direction of the flow and uh, to, to, to investigate the flow. And uh, it could be aircraft, could be airplane, could be birds or whatever. And uh, usually uh, visualization that display the direction uses colors to code the direction, which is not that efficient. You can use glyph like this. And we investigated particle systems like that. So I will be back to uh, look to the demo. Uh, I should have launched it first. And uh, that far, we use the same data set, one day of recorded aircraft trajectories. And uh, what we did is we spreaded particles along a path. So here is my data set. Standard visualization could be something like this. You see moving aircraft. Let's speed it up a bit. But it's really hard to really understand the flows, right, with this uh, kind of visualization. So what we did is this particle system. Can we display it? Oops. Look. So yeah, I think that you can see it right now. I can a little bit uh, darken the particles like this. OK. And now this data, that, data set makes sense. And I, I really love this kind of uh, design because um, the particles are uh, resistant to overlapping. No matter dense data is, you're still able to see the flow. Especially here, this is the main airport in France. That's Roissy Charles de Gaulle. It's quite fuzzy, right? But no matter what, you're still able to see that there is something here going there. And, and here, it's, it's, it's quite blurry, but still working. But OK, the visualization is not enough. For sure, we need also to interact with this system. And uh, what we did is, OK, we, for instance, if we investigate those two flows, so let's have another look. It's going from Geneva here, Lyon, Toulouse, and getting to Spain. They have opposite directions. So what we can do is select them. So we do a selection box, right, like this, which is good. And we can go into multidimensional data like this. So we change to the altitude, so you can understand what's going on. And you can refine your selection like this. So it's a way to do, uh, so it's a 3D selection, but it can be anything, because we, we can change the altitude with something else if we want to. Because there were also yeah. flows that went in different Yeah, you pick, yeah you're fast, right? <laughs> so you see, so that's, that's what's easy. So another one, which is not that easy, you'll see, with the direction. And this is why the paper has been accepted. It's thanks to this. So now nothing has been selected. Why? Because there is a bug in the system, I know. but. It's a way to show you this, which is the way you define the selection. And I think that's very, really, very convenient. So you define at the same time the direction, but also the width of your selection. Here, I mean 360 degrees. Here, let's say a few degrees, you see? So I think in terms of, of uh, interaction, it's really convenient, because we find a way to combine two filtering systems at once. Okay. And then we can do the same thing here to define the altitude. Like this. OK, here we go. Oops. OK, and I can go back on my system. Like this. And uh, OK, maybe I wasn't, uh, I just didn't, OK, like this. And uh, now the thing that we can investigate as well is this. OK, I can just display the one that I've been selected. And something just appears right now. You can see that each line have opposite direction. That's something that we know. I mean, air traffic controllers knows that very well. But aircraft flying at different altitudes do not have the same direction, just to avoid frontal, uh, to avoid frontal collisions. Right? It's a way to, 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 to um, uh, cluster the altitude. But it's always good to, re, uh, to, to see what you expect. So that's a good point. And then the next thing that you can do is basically doing some analytics here. We extract the flows. OK, like this, and do some comparison, overlapping, like this, or compare the different flow over time, 
like this. Okay, and then and then and then that's a computation it should be this. So now what I've did is a metaphor of the um, how do you call that um, the density not density uh, traffic. Yeah, traffic comparison, uh, voltmeter, or, or uh, intensity computation. And then you can see that the blue one, the flow from the, the, the top, is uh, higher uh, every time except at uh, lunchtime and uh, at 4 uh, in, the, in the evening. And, uh, and the funny thing is that if this is a Monday data set, so, and if you do that on the Friday, it is opposite. You see, so. And then we have many of ongoing projects starting from that. So really, people want to uh, understand what you can do with this, uh, this system, because it can be really convenient. Once this is done, you can move the, the boxes, and uh, you can say that I want that uh, the interse intersection between two boxes. I want this and this, not this. And then it can make a very interactive system. And then follow up is we want to make a what if system. Like, what if we increase by 10% the density in this area? What will be impact? So, but it's uh, now beginning to be a big project. Uh, so clearly, not every uh, particle is in a flight. Yes, right. I just forget to say that. <laughs> uh, how do you determine the density of particles per flight? So, and how do you avoid getting like, if you don't know that? Like, I look at it and I see, oh, look at all these flights. But clearly, this is maybe I don't know how many flights are in the figure that you you showed us. Yeah, so, yeah, that there was a. Histogram, yes. how many flights are so in, there in a day? In total, uh, if I'm right, I cannot get the information right now, but I think it's uh, 50,000 uh, uh, aircraft. And what we, we do is like on one path, we spread 10 particles. So, and uh, for sure, this is something that is not really satisfactory. Right? We need really to, uh, to assess that. So it depends on the t density of the data sets. So, and uh, and uh, we don't want uh, visualization to be dis uh, disruptive and to, be, to, to, to carry false information. But here, at some point, it's false, right? Because it's not the actual traffic density. But uh, if we take just into account the design space of how can I display the directions, this design makes it. Makes it. So. OK, so enough of this, uh, this demo. Okay. Mm, let's jump to uh, this uh, uh, the next one, which is uh, uh, the view simplification. So we investigated uh, how to interact with uh, large or big data sets, and now uh, we want to. Uh, I, I will explain what we did regarding view simplification. So. Basically, usually, I take this example, which is uh, quite a dense data set of uh, uh, US migration people during uh, one, one year. It's uh, 2000, I guess. And uh, so people move from one place to another one. And then we, we, we display a line that connects those two locations. And uh, this graph has already been processed in the sense that we use transparent lines. If they are not transparent, it's just blank, right? You cannot see anything. But even though it's really hard to extract any kind of information rather than the outline of the US. Okay. So what we did is we did some edge banding computation, like this, plus processing, like that. And from this kind of processing, we managed to extract some mainstream, right? Uh, we do not have yet the direction, but I will come later on that point. But still, we can see our um, uh, we can make some information emerge from this data set. So how does that work? Here is the animation. So there are many uh, edge burning algorithms, right? So the one I'm going to present is called kernel density estimation. So that's the one we did in 2012. And uh, its main asset is that it's highly scalable. So uh, basically, most people know, uh, know a hierarchical edge burning technique or force directed edge burning, and there is no way to compute uh, to, 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 uh, to compute the, the, the bending result of this data set where, with this algorithm. So how does that work? So it's, it's very straightforward. It's like each line is a magnet, and we like track the surrounding, and it's an uh, iterative process. And this comes from this very simple uh, thought, which means that edge bending tries to make the view clearer, right? And how is it clear? It's just like if you compute the density map of this data set, which is the bundled version of that one, this is 
for uh, far more sharpened. So you have high peaks of density. So how can you make peaks of density? Well, pretty easy. Compute the density, compute the gradient, thanks to the density, and then gather things toward high density values. Really straightforward, right? So that's the pipeline that we, we did. You have a data set, you compute a density map, here I use a bump mapping to show you quite high dense uh, areas, and then you have some gradients that will attract every edges toward high density values. Then you end up with this, quite messy for sure, because uh, the, the gradient is, uh, is a, it creates a lot of noise, for sure. And then you filter, and then you go on, like this, with, with, with Laplace, Laplace and filter. And that's how it's working. So when you say density, what you're really finding then is places where there's a lot of intersection. Uh, yes, exactly, overlapping, yes, sure, yeah. So what we do is like, for sure, you have, not, not really, yeah. The, the thing that I didn't tell is that you take an edge, you subdivide the edge, okay? And then you're able to compute the density along the edge, right? Uh, but that's, that's a good point. Uh, we could also do that with crossings. But in this case, if we do that, it means that the crossings have a highly significant value. That's what I was wondering, yeah. Mm. So, and for aircraft, yeah, for sure, it could make, make sense because where you have crossings, it means that you have crossing flight roads, something like that. But uh, what is uh, nice with this system is that you do not need to have any uh, initial thought about your data set. Take your data set and bundle it. So with a hierarchical edge bundling, you need to have a hierarchy already uh, in, the, embedded in your, in your data set. Here, we don't know uh, anything about the data set. So I can show you uh, uh, the last version of the edge bundling technique we have. This is the, all the landing sequences uh, on Paris. Paris, Charles de Gaulle, right here, Orly, the two biggest airports in France. We can aggregate them, so it, it creates kind of a visual simplification, right? You can use some tune shading if you want, or fancy uh, bl color blending computation, like this. We also investigated in more details how we can take into account the direction, because uh, for sure, it's, that, that's something very, very important. So again, with the aircraft trajectory, so if we take this data set, the one that I already presented to you, we can bundle it thanks to the dire direction and we end up with this. So each line also has the width that corresponds to the density. And this is nice because the density is, is already computed with this uh, kernel density estimation edge bending technique. And you end up with this visualization with the two flow that we already investigated, all right? here, and a very complex area right here uh, on Paris. And we can zoom in here, and uh, then you have the main airport, Roissy Charles de Gaulle, Orly, the second biggest airport in France. And what is interesting is the very first time where we managed to clarify the view, where we, where we could see this double X process, like you have four incoming flows that get to Paris, and four outcoming flows that are just rotated. And we, are, we, are, we went able to, to, to just get them from the actual uh, flight path. Because for sure you can do that with the, with, with the um, a sequence of beacons that each aircraft has to follow. So, but it's fake, right? So, so we did that with, uh, with the actual location of the aircraft. So uh, the work that we, uh, we extended here is, um, uh, is using dynamic graphs. So I think that's, highly valuable. Since this uh, edge bending computation is very fast, uh, so this demo showed you how it's working with uh, and drawing uh, trajectories or path, so we can do that in real time. There are two parameters, which are the attraction parameters and the filtering parameter. And now we can do that with dynamic graphs. So this is one week of aircraft trajectories over the United States. So I will let the, the video go a little bit. So on the morning, a lot of aircraft just took off here and get spreaded. You have a lot of shapes here that are really interesting. So I will jump to that a bit later. And at night, everybody gets shrinked into a left, right uh, trajectories, which correspond to postal aircraft, right? So uh, we can do that all over France if we want. So there are many interesting things here uh, with this algorithm. The first one uh, is that it's not disruptive, which means that no matter what's happening in your graph, 
you will always have a smooth transition. And it's, it's, it's very, very important because there was no uh, edge branding techniques able to do that. Usually you take a frame, time frame of your data, you bundle it, you have something. You slide a little bit your time frame, you bundle it, you have something else that is not related. But this is compulsory to be related. Why? Because we use mean shift algorithm, that's the way that we compute this density map. This density map is obviously and has to be continuous, and there is no way to do it otherwise. So if you dig into the paper, everything is explained. And that's for we can have these sliding windows, and then we, have, we can see the evolution of the graph over time. So it's the very first time we could do that. And uh, so we, we are still investigating these evolutions because you see you have these bubbles that get shrinked, exploded, and so on. So this is directly linked to the traffic density. So we are still in progress to, 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 to extract some top level information from this graph. So yeah, I know it's, it's nice, appealing, but then we need also to extract uh, concrete information. But then there's also a downside to that in the sense that it's quite path dependent. So hmm? You have to consider where you began the simulation. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, we also know how to counter that because we can start with an initial map which cannot be related to the data set if you really want to. So, but that, that's definitely part of the research. Yeah. I will show you um, another instance uh, how we used this uh, edge branding technique thanks to uh, eye tracking system. So this is a gaze, recorded gaze of a pilot on a landing sequence. And this pilot managed to land perfectly. It was in a simulation for sure. So and here, uh, the, the goal of this experimentation was to try to understand what are the minimum information to help the, the pilot to have a good situation awareness, right? So, um, so I know it's really dark, but here is a cockpit, and on top here is the outside view. So usually to uh, understand this data, we use density maps, heat map, like this, right? But we use edge branding technique. So what can we get from that? It's a way to simplify the view, and you, we have been able to extract this, you see? So it's three dense areas, but also it creates this T-shape, and this T-shape is Something that we know. So when you learn how to fly it, you have to follow a specific path, like looking straight, up, left, right, step, you see? And this pilot managed to, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not a strong correlation, but no matter what, this pilot was the only one to have this really good path, good T-shape. And, and, uh, and we have been able to, to extract that from, uh, from this eye tracking uh, system uh, with the uh, Canada density edge banding. So there is a lot of work that was to be done uh, with, with it. We extended, we extended the, the, this with uh, the direction as well. So here, there is no direction in the gaze, but OK. Uh, now let's jump to the third part of my presentation with, this, with uh, the animation. Uh, so let's go back to some demos. Uh, where is it? Some more view right here. So this work has been done in 2011, and uh, okay. So th the basic idea was again to use animation, and uh, so I take again my Okay, I take again my data set of aircraft trajectories, and I use this lens, and I can filter aircraft fine to their altitude. So I, I use with my mouse. So what we really wanted to understand is if, if the animation can help us to understand what is going on. So I'm filtering low altitude aircraft. I can barely see some airports. And then little by little, I add some trajectories. So some are getting in, some are getting out. You see? So wait, did the lens change just from you staying there, or did it change because no, you were you, spinning the mouse? You're spinning the mouse. Ah, uh, yeah, you can, sorry. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm playing with the mouse wheel. OK, but what I mean is when you first saw the, when you were first on low altitude, yes. it felt like you panned into that area and there was nothing. And then a moment later, something appeared. Uh, Is yeah. that you turning the mouse wheel? Yes. So oh, now okay. I'm just picking tick, up. Something's coming again. Tick, ding. So now you're just letting in more and more low altitude aircraft. Yes. Exactly. So, and it's a, it's a, a, a range filtering like this. 
Oh. Or that the uh, animation lags behind the interaction. What do you mean? The state of the animation is not the place where the mouse wheel is. No, yeah. So you move, wait is half a second, move, wait half a second. Yeah. Great for demos. Yes. But I can imagine if I was actually using the tool. Yeah, exactly. It makes so, it difficult to search the space. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you will see the, the, the next demo. So it wasn't the core of this paper, but it was the basic idea. So we wanted to, to, to go beyond that. And uh, what we say, like, well, in fact, we are doing some filtering, but we can also do some layout change. So let's do this thing, yes, which is far more compelling, like going from the standard data set to a bundled version, you see? So in fact, if you look at the paper, it's exactly the same pipeline. Instead of filtering, it's a dual view processing. So why is that interesting? So at that time, it was very, very interesting because the, we, we didn't add any tool to assess edge bonding technique. So, and here it was the very first time when you can see the standard version and the bundled version. And here, you can see something strange. What is that? It's wrong, right? It could not be, I mean, there's something strange here. Because if you look at these trajectories, it gets that thing, gets back here, right? So there is a kind of a deformation. So I kept this data set because it was the, the, one of the first edge burning techniques that we developed, and there was a bug here. So, and it helped us to really figure out that was wrong. Right? There's also some limitation with edge burning that we can see right here. You see those two flows that get attracted, and that should not be. Right? I mean, they could. Well, it depends on the parameters that you, you, you want to use. Right? So, and here you have the global. So I think what is interesting, so to go back and forth, I just use the left button of my mouse. So, and then the user is the one in charge of um, taking uh, or controlling the animation a little bit, right? Just on or off. So we also did, uh, so let's do that. Uh, yes, oh yeah, Lo load image uh, with uh, on you, that one. OK, filtering, is that L? Uh, ash, U. Ah, no, it's L. And it's L. Yes. We also did this. And maybe I should have started with that one. Sorry. OK. Which is somehow really, really cool. Yeah, like this. So I have an image. It's a pure image. And thanks to this lens, I can peel a little bit the view by removing a given pixel thanks to a, de a luminosity. And then I'm able to see all the vessels, uh, blood vessels uh, at the end. And here, I think that the filtering somehow may worse it. Little by little, you can see what you add or what you remove, right? Uh, yeah, sure. This is basically histogram manipulation of the image. Histogram interpolation? Yeah, yeah, manipulation. manipulation. Ah, sure. It is. Because uh, I'm pretty sure I've seen my dentist do this for x ray but for them it's just you, there's a histogram and you move the filters. Exactly. And you don't need this, this lens. I'm not sure why do I need a lens. Exactly. So, so the lens here, so it's not a contribution. It's just say, OK, we can use it to do animation. And now the question is, remains, because I do not answer it, is the animation worth it? Right. So, but I will show you another use case where the animation worth it. Uh, I know, tick, tick, so it's, uh, is it, cool? yeah, that's that, that one. So it's a bit, uh, it's, it's very, very specific here. Is that, yes, okay, here we go. So we have an image. It's pure pixels, right? And then I'm jumping into a color space. Color space, it's a, a LCH, so it's a chromacity around that, luminosity here. So I have two layouts, Oops. and then I can play the animation. So what is interesting is right on the top, there is a kind of a description. You have every colors except on the very top, you have a all here. So, and, and when we saw that, we said, well, something is wrong because the color codes the distance between voxels. And there should not be any, any, any all, right? It's impossible because you have voxels everywhere, right? 
and accept that there is a hole. And no matter what we do with the with the image, because it's a it's a, a three D image that has been flattened, we always have this hole. And which means that our algorithm that computed the color is wrong. So, well, so little by little, thanks to the animation, we've been able to see where this hole could be, and the animation just give us a small insight, very small insight. So I will jump to the next demo, where the animation takes all of its assets, which is uh, that one. Yeah, so it's, uh, it was before Istomage. Yes, so for the one who knows Istomage, uh, I, I won't do the demo of Istomage to, uh, today, uh, so it has been presented at, at least. But that's the thing that we did before Istomage, which is this histogram. You have an image here, and you can jump to the histogram. So we were f first thinking that this animation really was it. Like, OK, it's nice, right? but it could also help the user to understand how an histogram is built. Well, but what we did by serendipity, because it's really serendipity here, we investigated over this layout. So basically, how can I compute this? It's really straightforward. Like I have each pixels, have a location in the image space, but also have a location in this color space, right? And I do pure interpolation. And when I do this interpolation, maybe you can see them here. There are few outliers at some point, I don't know, that are not visible here, they are not visible here. And since I'm the one who controlling the animation, I can stop here if I want. I can brush them. And I can go on here. OK, they are here. I go back here. Oops. They are right here, all gathered around the same pixel. I remove them. I zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. It's some kind of reddish pixels. And I look at in every of my images that I took with this camera. All the same have this issue. It's a dead pixel. So I know it's, it's very little, right? But still, so that's why I say it's serendipity. So just the animation show me like, wow, what is this? Oh, maybe we found something here. We found something where the animation can help us to really understand the, uh, get something from the data set. So, so what we did next is to try to scale these uh, ideas. And we developed. Uh, these things, which is called um, DataViz. So we, we wanted to, to push a little bit forward uh, with this big data manipulation. So we looked for a kind of a big data set that we had. So it's one million of voxels. So it's a 3D visualization here. So that's the thing that some of you already seen. Uh, so uh, for the one who don't know about CT scan, so CT scan is something like this. You piled up slices. But usually, when you display this, you use a dead buffer or other techniques or recasting, not to display everything at once. But here, this is not what we wanted to do. Like, we want to push the limit of the animation, so we want to display everything at every time. So, and we did. Up, I will show you just, just this so that you will see that everything is displayed at the same time, like this. Because if you do this, right, you, you don't know where each voxel here, and you need to take into the, the, the animation. So you can do every really complex computation to figure out what should be displayed. Or you can display everything. And then it's become easy. So and to do that, you, my, my computer is about to cry right now because it's heavily, heavily computational uh, challenging here. My graphic card is doing all the computation. But well, so let's see what we can do with this system. We can, again, jump between a 2D and 2D visualization. So this one is the density of the tissue. Here, low density, high density. And since it's an histogram, you have the number of occurrences that share the same density. You have one peak here, another one, another one. So this is low density. How can you be sure about that? You can just use animation. And you can see how these voxels get spread around the, the head of this poor guy. But you can also interact with it. You just remove this and go back here, and you go on like this, right? So this is what I call direct manipulation of well, pix a big data set for sure, but uh, with, with pixel-based uh, technique. And then you can go on like this, and it's, it's uh, somehow how you can sculpt because I add, you see, I add, I removed. Okay, I can use this as a way to decide what I want to add or to remove. 
in the way just I push a low density uh, values so I can see in advance what I'm going to, to, to remove and so on. So, um, so what I can do is, okay, let's see, uh, do I still have time? Yes, a little bit time. So I can maybe show you the, um, uh, the, the, the full demo where I managed to extract the brain because the brain is something quite hard to extract from this data set. Uh, so um, it was really challenging to find a way to uh, use direct manipulation to extract the brain. So here you can see the brain, right? If you use a standard filtering technique, like I remove low density, like this, I can go on, go on, go on, go on. Uh, ah, I remove the brain, but I still have the skull that hinders me, that provide me to see the brain, right? So, okay, let's do this the opposite way. I remove high density values, so a bit of low density, cool. Let's go on, okay, high density. So I remove the skull, which is good, right? No more skull, right here. Uh, but I go on and um, I remove the brain, but still remain the skin. Ah, done, I'm done. So, uh, the one who are uh, dealing with brain knows that the good technique is to use a gradient. So why? Because there is a kind of a gradient inversion when you go from the tissue to the bone or to the bone to the tissue. Well, so it's not that complex, but still. Uh, so what we can do is like, okay, let's remove low density because I know that my brain is here, right? It's a, it corresponds to the density of the, 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 the skin. So, okay, here is my guy with the brain somewhere. So now I change my view to this, which is a gradient on two axes, like on Z axis, and on, let's say, the X axis. Uh, well, so it's a 3D view, right? But I can ask the system to jump into 2D, like this. And then I play the animation between the 3D toward the gradient. And then, look at that. During the animation, there is something that pops out of the head of this guy, right? Mm -hmm. And it gets on the top. Say, so, wow, the animation shows me something. So what if I remove the bottom part, whoops, like this, oh, I'm good. And here we go, you see. So, um, well, it's not, it's not the best thing uh, we, uh, we, we ever done with dark manipulation, but still, well, the animation again helped us to, 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 to find the next step in our investigation. So now we have the brain, and you can go on like this, you can play with the light if you want to, and so on, blah, blah. Okay, uh, maybe I can jump, let's see. Well, so I will speed up a bit my presentation. I have so many uh, funny things like this, yeah. Okay, the next thing that we did is we used uh, Dalavis as a way to investigate images with the um, clustering of uh, skin, uh, skin cancer like this, but maybe I will skip that. I will show you the, 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 what, what my PhD students are working on right now. Because I think now we are jumping into something else. We, we did some kind of a, a science, but now we are going to apply that. We are going to apply that on this. So it's a bit luggage uh, exploration. So now it's a whole new system where you use the recasting and all that stuff. And we are going to do some direct manipulation with the lens. You see the lens here, all right? So it's uh, just a way to uh, use whatever we find interesting in Dalavis from Daddy and the Morview and to apply that to uh, luggage uh, exploration. Uh, so uh, I'm really close to, 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 to the end. And uh, maybe as a recap, because I, I always say that we are uh, investigating big data sets and uh, big is a bit fuzzy, right? What does that mean really? So uh, since um, uh, we are doing some uh, information visualization, we need to have some metrics. So for me, BIGS is directly connected to the screen. So the screen has a given number of pixels. When you have more record that number of pixels of your screen, then I think that we are investigating big data sets. Because at that point, you need to do some aggregation, data simplification, visual simplification. So that's why I say that Right now, and uh, uh, there is also something interesting, like the screen also never stops to increase in terms of number of pixels as long as the graphic cards uh, increase in terms of computation. So, and so I think that is going to, to, to work like that. So we, if I go on working with the graphic card as a way to do some visualization and interaction, I can go on like that. I will always uh, work with big data sets, you see? Big data set, but the, 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 this word bigs will go on uh, to, to increase. 
Uh, okay, so my presentation was about interaction technique, brushing, linking, view simplification, uh, animation. Oh yeah, I just forgot to, to, to show you this, but it's just one slide because this is a work that we, we, we conducted uh, here with, uh, with Fanny Chevalier, Nathalie, Catherine Plaisant, and uh, Amira Chablis uh, regarding animation. Because I never stopped to speak about animation, and we have this paper at AVI this year where we try to uh, figure out how animation has been useful. And we made uh, some categories uh, there, and uh, so uh, you can go on this web, web page and you, you will see. So uh, for instance, animation can help you to keep uh, in context. Uh, it can be a teaching aid, user experience, or user experience should be, for instance, to give you a world tour, a tour like explaining you the data set, especially what the wide telescope uh, project has been doing here. Uh, the animation can also help you to transmit some uh, uh, emotion. That's the one that Michel did with the font things. So uh, look at that. There, there is a lot of uh, examples, and I think it's really worth it really to, uh, it helps us to really understand how animation can be uh, helpful at some point. And I'm really close to, 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 to my takeaway message, like, okay, you, you figure it out, like I'm using visualization and interaction. And I think that, of course, this is a, the, the way that you mix both that will leverage user, user, user activity, especially when you want to extract information from, from a large data set. So let's some, do some promotion if you want to learn more. Of course, there is my research paper, but there is also this book where we try to gather uh, all of these research things and uh, try to make it more concrete with uh, concrete uh, examples. And uh, it's the end of uh, my talk. And if you have uh, questions, <laughs> more, uh, you want to take a picture of that one? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.